Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Hello and welcome to worship today, here in the Richmond and Hounslow Circuit of the Methodist Church in South West London. Once more, we're not broadcasting from a church, but from my home here in Putney. And wherever you're watching this, however you're watching it, whenever you're watching it, you are very welcome here today. And I do hope that this service finds you and your loved ones as well as possible in these difficult and trying days. My name's Geoffrey Farrer, and I'm the Superintendent Minister of this circuit. And it's a pleasure to be leading you once again in worship. Once more, our service has been put together by a number of people from across our circuit, and we're very grateful to all of them for giving so freely of their time and talents. Our introductory music was played for us by Nicola Morrison, the Methodist chaplain at the nearby University of Roehampton. And in a few moments, Margaret Harper, a member at Richmond United Church and one of our circuit stewards, will lead us in our prayers of adoration and confession. But before that, Tom and Jessica Dalton and their friends will lead us in our opening hymn, God, whose almighty word, Chaos and darkness heard. We sing together. Loving God, our Father and our Mother, we offer you our praise and worship this day. And even though we cannot see each other in this difficult and uncertain time, we are united by your Spirit with all people who are worshipping this day. And remember, in particular, those who are worshipping in other countries far away, where medical aid is scarce and where they may be particularly vulnerable to this virus. You alone are worthy of our praise and our adoration. You alone have made the universe and all within it. You alone are our creator, redeemer and sustainer. May we worship you this day and always in heart, body and mind and soul. And help us, we pray, not just to be the bearers of your word, but doers. We pray for all those who have helped put this service together and who have prepared and recorded it so that we might see it this day. May your spirit rest upon them 
as we receive your holy word. Forgive us when we close our hearts and minds to you and when we are overcome by worry or despair and are distracted by the priorities of this world, leading us away from the values of your kingdom. Forgive us for being inward looking and failing to remember that those who may have far greater difficulties than ours. Pardon us from all our sins and grant us your grace this day, not for our own sakes, but through the mercy and love of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who died that we may not die and lived that we might know life in all its fullness. We offer these prayers in the name of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Margaret. Now, before I forget, to accompany all our Sunday services, there is also a video for Sunday school children and for teenagers, produced by our wonderful circuit youth leader, Megan Thomas, who's broadcasting to us from Wales. And in the description box below, there should be a link to those videos, and they're also available on this YouTube channel. So please do explore those later, and please do recommend them to friends and family uh, of people who cannot get to church at this time, because they're really excellent. And I know that many of us are watching the teenage slot in particular, and feeling very challenged by some of the questions Megan's asking. The theme of our service today is the spirit of adoption words that come from Paul's letter to the Romans, which we shall hear later. Now, as many of you know, in uh, a week or so's time, I shall be beginning a, an extended period of leave uh, as we adopt a child, a young boy. This has been a long journey for my partner and I, and um, it's been good to share that, some of that story with uh, members of my congregation in the past months. Now, I was very reticent about leading this service today, but it was one I wanted to lead before I went on adoption leave uh, under normal circumstances. And I hesitated about uh, using this material today because I know there's so much bad news at present. But I think this remains a very important subject, the subject of adoption and fostering. And sadly, we know that one of the effects of the coronavirus is that even more children are being put into danger and will ultimately have to go into care. So it's a subject we need to know something about. But I also know that any time we discuss issues around family in the church, it can provoke very difficult and painful memories and associations for people. Even when we pray, God, our Father, that is a difficult term for some people I know. But I hope that I can share with you some good news and also share with you how God is deeply concerned about this issue. Something that's been, very, been made very clear to me this week as we've been studying passages related to adoption in the Bible in our daily Bible studies. So I hope you can bear with us and I hope you can hold on for the good news at the end because there is ultimately good news. And we're going to hear three readings today, and I will reflect for just produce three short reflections. I thought perhaps if I'm allowed three reflections today, that's enough, and then you, you got rid of me for four months. Um, so three readings. In a few moments, we shall hear Mary Patterson, a member at Heston, and another of our circuit stewards, reading to us from Deuteronomy. But before that, Colin Flynn, a member here at Putney, will read to us about the birth and youth of Moses from the book of Exodus. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. 
she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, Why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, Who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid. Well, this isn't the Nile. Even if the travel restrictions permitted it, I don't think the circuit budget would stretch that far. So I'm stood here by the Beverly Brook on Barnes Common as we reflect upon that story from Exodus. Let's just pray before I begin. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In many senses, that story of Moses in the bulrushes, which I'm sure many of us know from Sunday school, is a microcosm of the book of Exodus and the first adventures of God's people in the Bible. Moses in his basket, and this is my best attempt at a Moses basket in lockdown, more like a picnic basket, I think. Moses in his basket, saved from destruction. And it's intriguing that that word in Hebrew, the word in Hebrew used for the basket that Moses is put into, is only used twice in our Old Testament. The first, uh, t the second time, is for Moses in his basket. But before that, it's used to describe the boat that Moses, uh, that Noah builds, the ark. Both of them rudderless boats designed to save their people from destruction. And that story of Moses, as I say, a microcosm of what's going on in Exodus. Moses cries out in the bulrushes and is heard and rescued. God's people cry out in slavery in Egypt and are heard and God sends a rescuer and delivers them from their peril. Now there's much we could say about that story of Moses, but there's three points that seem particularly relevant to me as I'm about to embark on our adoption journey. The first is that very sadly adoption always starts, or nearly always starts, with terror and fear. When we look across the world, the plight of Moses seems very relevant. Children who are suffering at the hands of dictators and terrorists, who have been forced to flee their home, who are suffering in refugee camps and elsewhere, facing real terror, fear, poverty and uh, violence. And in our own country, we need to escape the myths we may have about adoption and the romanticisation of orphans we find in many stories. Today in Britain, a tiny fraction of children in care are relinquished babies, babies that are given up because their parents feel they cannot cope. The vast, vast majority are taken forcibly from their parents when things get so bad. And one of the saddest things I had to learn when we were going through the process of adoption was just how bad things have to get before children are taken into care, how much they have to see, how much they have to experience. Um, and we can't talk about this too much on a Sunday morning, and I know all of us are facing such sad times already. But as Christians, we cannot shy away from the t truth. We are called by scriptures to be as innocent as doves, but as wise as serpents. And I'll just give you one thought. One adoptive parent wrote, she wrote to her teacher to try and help her understand what was going on. And she said, these children have not just seen a little bit of abuse, a little bit of neglect, gone without a meal or two. They have faced what we would in many other circumstances call torture. 
So Moses' story there of terror and fear is typical, sadly, of so many children's beginnings of their adoption journey and their fostering journey. And the second truth from that story of Moses, an ancient truth but still a very relevant one, is the effect that adoption and fostering and what leads to it has on a child in later life. That bit of the story we often miss out of Moses, of Moses going down and killing the Egyptian overseer, of committing a crime and then fleeing from the scene of that murder. The sad truth is that adoption and fostering, however well managed, leaves scars on a child's life. And those questions that Moses struggled with about identity are those that many children struggle with too. Moses in our passage seems to be struggling with that. Am I Jewish? Am I Hebrew? Or am I Egyptian? Am I a princess's family? Or am I a slave's family? Who am I? And we can see that struggle working its way out in the violence he perpetuates. And the same is true for children in adoption and in our care systems today and in later life struggling with questions of identity and who they are, who they're meant to be. And that hardest question, the question that most children in care seem to struggle with, am I lovable? Am I po is it possible that somebody could love me? Am I not a wicked person? And that is why bad things have happened to me. And many children in care cannot get beyond that question because they feel they have done something wrong because otherwise they wouldn't be punished in this way. They wouldn't have lost their parents. And they struggle to love themselves and therefore love other people. And it's a sad fact that adopted and fostered people in our country make up a tiny percentage of the population, but they make up more than 25% of our prison population. More than a quarter of all prisoners have had some time in care. And they, in turn, and children who have been adopted and fostered, sadly are much more likely to go off the rails, we might say, to do badly at school, not to go to university, to end up involved with crime, and in turn to become parents of children who are taken into care themselves. That cycle of deprivation. The third point, and we begin to turn the corner, I hope, in this, what is quite a tough message today, the third point, and the vital point, is that God hears the cries of those in need, of those children in, uh, in adoption and fostering. Moses, in the bulrushes, in his basket, cries out and is heard. And the Bible, and we've been looking at this in the, uh, our daily Bible studies this week, the Bible tells us that God hears their cries. Later in Exodus, God specifically says to Moses, I hear the cry of the orphan and the widow, and if you oppress them, I shall know. It is not God's will that these children should suffer. It is God's will that their cries should be heard and they should be nurtured and cared for and have the loving family they deserve. And God wants us to hear their cries too and care for them. How can we respond to this seemingly overwhelming problem? Well, let's go on in the Old Testament and hear our next reading from Deuteronomy, and that may give us a place to start. The reading is taken from Deuteronomy, chapter 24, verses 17 to 22. You shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan of justice you shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. Remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be left for the alien, the orphan, and the widow, so that the Lord your God may bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, do not strip what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. 
when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. It shall be for the alien, the orphan, and the widow. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this. Amen. Well, at first sight, we might be wondering what on earth that passage has got to do with fostering and adoption. Well, in the first place, there's that threefold list that we find and God saying to his people, you must have specific care for the widow, the orphan and the alien, the stranger in the land, reminding us that orphans and adopted and foster children have always been high on the God's priority for those about whom we should care. But there's another reason as well, and that is the reason why we are called to care. Remember, says the passage, remember you were a slave in Egypt. Remember what it felt like. Remember how it was to have no land, to be dispossessed, to be, have no food of your own. Remember and act accordingly. In other words, have empathy with those people. Put yourselves in their shoes and respond appropriately. And that really chimes with me because like all uh, adoptive parents, we've had a lot of training over the last year as we prepare for our placement. And the key lesson that we have learned is that we are called to have empathy with our child, to see the world through their perspective and not to respond until we have thought through what an empathetic response would be like. Let me give you an example. A plate of biscuits out on the counter after church. A child comes along, eats the whole lot. How do we respond? Bad child, naughty child, wicked child, greedy child. And we might have a few words, if we're honest, about the parenting style and blame the parents and say, well, of course, they can't keep their child under control. But let's put ourselves into the shoes of that child. Let's see the world through their perspective. The sad truth is that most children who have been through the care system have a very dysfunctional relationship with food. There probably wasn't enough food growing up. It was probably the wrong food. There was no certainty or regularity about when that food would come. Food may have been used as a control mechanism. So when that child sees the plate of biscuits, they think, I'll eat now and chance the consequences because I don't know when the next meal might come. Even if they're now in a safe adoptive placement where there's three meals a day on the table, that damage that has been done in the past cannot be wiped away easily. Another example, a child in school looking around the place, not concentrating on what the teacher's saying, not concentrating on their work, not getting their work done. How do we respond? Bad child, naughty child, lazy child, detention, punishment. But think again from the perspective of that child. What does the world look like? Perhaps they're focused entirely on the door of the classroom. Who's going to come through next? Is it a bad person coming through next? Is it going to be somebody who's going to harm me? Remember these children have learnt to their cost that not all adults are to be trusted. Or perhaps they're thinking about where they're going home that night. Sadly, so many foster placements break down and foster placements and children are moved uh, with a few hours notice and often they're not even told what's happening. Simply their possessions are put into a bin bag and they're taken to the next place. And in many cases, children in foster care will go to school from one house and be picked up by total strangers and go home to another house. So perhaps that child's thinking, is that going to happen today? Where am I going tonight? Will my toys be there? Will the things I treasure be taken or will they be forgotten? So no wonder that child can't concentrate on their English or their maths. That child needs our empathy first. Or put ourselves into the shoes of foster carers and adoptive parents. Because the sad truth again uh, that we've read and heard about from many parents is that their child is the child nobody wants to play with. 
their child is the troublemaker in the class. They're the child that nobody wants to invite home for a sleepover or a party because they're not a good child. They're not the sort of people we want our child to be friends with. One adoptive mother spoke about how she has to make a real effort and in, she says for every 10 times that she invites somebody to their house, they will get one invitation back if they're lucky. What must that feel like for the child? What must that feel like for the parents? And we as Christians in this field are called not only to respond with money and with charity, but with understanding and perhaps to create environments where we can demonstrate real empathy with those children and those who care for them. And I think this strange time of coronavirus perhaps is giving us a greater sense of empathy and the greater importance of empathy. I think and I hope and pray that we are all a little more empathetic now, that we can more easily put ourselves into the shoes of those who were already isolated, those who were already lonely, those who were already worried about their jobs and their homes and where the next meal was coming from. And perhaps in the future, a little bit like that lesson from Deuteronomy, we might say to one another, remember what it was like during COVID-19. Remember when there wasn't any food on the shelves. Remember when we were worried about where the next delivery was going to come from. Remember when we didn't see anybody from day in, day, from one day to the next, and that we might change accordingly. And as Christians, of course, we worship a God who exercised the greatest empathy that has ever been seen in all history. That is a God who chose to make God's self into a human, to become flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, to live our life and die our death, that he might show God's solidarity with, one another, with all of us. Now we may be wondering where on earth is all the good news in all of this? Well, that's coming now with Paul's letter to the Romans, which is going to be read to us by Carol, who herself is an adopt, both an adoptive mother and a foster carer. But before that, let's sing together a hymn that speaks of our solidarity, of our call to care for one another in Christ's name. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you.
Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. Thank you, Carol. Well, as you can see, I've moved indoors. That's partly because the weather changed, but also because my camera battery died. Perhaps God's trying to tell me to deliver shorter sermons. So we've heard then from Exodus and God hearing the cry of the orphaned Moses on the banks of the River Nile. And we've heard from Deuteronomy and that call for us to have empathy with all those in need, all those who are suffering. And before the hymn, I promised you good news. Well, where is it? Well, if I'm honest, during our adoption journey, like many others, we have often struggled to find the good news because there seems to be just so much bad news. We have encountered terrible stories of children who have experienced the very worst treatment and abuse. We have met foster carers and adoptive parents who have been pushed to the very limits of human endurance by children scarred for life by what they have experienced. And we have worked with social, uh, social workers desperately trying to do the best for the children in their care in a system that is utterly overwhelmed and completely underfunded. We need to be very clear that these children are different from other children because of what they have experienced. And nearly all will need a lifetime of care and nurture to recover from their childhood trauma. Personally, I had no idea how bad things were in the care system until I started this process. And that is unacceptable. Because as our readings today and the readings we have studied this week have shown, we are called by God to have a special place in our hearts for those children, just as God has. Now the beginning of the good news is of course that women and men for 2,000 years have heeded that call have had a special place in their heart for such children. Women and men like Thomas Bowman Stevenson, the Methodist minister in the 19th century, who was called to London, and like that princess on the banks of the Nile so long ago, heard the cries of the children in need, witnessed for himself the terrible conditions in which they were living, and was inspired to establish the first National Children's Home, the organisation that would become the charity Action for Children, whose work we celebrate each year on Action for Children Sunday in the Methodist Church, and whom we, in the organisation that we support in our giving throughout the year. But there is more good news, and that is the good news contained in Paul's letter to the first Christians in Rome, where Paul is trying to speak of the magnitude of what God has done for each one of us in Jesus Christ. And he uses metaphor and language that his first audience would have been very familiar with. The language of slavery and freedom, of redemption and of adoption. And he says to them, and through them to us, that God loves each one of us so much that he has given us the power to become not just followers, not just believers, but beloved children of God enjoying such an intimate relationship with our, God, uh, with our Creator that we may call God Abba, Daddy. That is good news for all, but it is especially good news for children in our care system. 
because it speaks of the power of hope and the possibility of change. It says to those children that just because you started through no fault of your own in the worst possible situations, you are not doomed to become just another statistic. It says to those children that just because you believe you are unlovable, you doesn't mean that you are. It says to them that just because your birth family were unable to care for you does not mean that you will never know nurture and love and care. It says to them that the world does not have to be as it is. And that is good news for them. And it's good news for us all because it speaks of the power of, and the possibility of transformation. It says that there is no situation so hopeless, so desperate, that it cannot be transformed through the love of Christ. It says to this world now that even illness and coronavirus and death can be transformed into life and life in all its fullness through the mercy of God and his eternal love witnessed in Jesus Christ. That passage says that that spirit of adoption is open to all, that all may know that they are loved, all may know that they are children of God, all may know a special and privileged relationship with their maker, their creator and their redeemer. That is good news. That is the good news we have to share with these children. That is the good news we have to share with our world the power of hope and the possibility of change, the possibility that the world might become the world God wants it to be and we might become the people God wants us to be and that we might enjoy that privileged and special relationship, that spirit of adoption telling us all in our hearts that we are beloved children of God each one of us, today and every day. And I hope and pray that we may accept, acknowledge and know that truth in our hearts, today and always. Amen. Well, we're going to sing a hymn now, a hymn that is well known to many of us, I'm sure. A hymn that speaks of the wonders of what God has done for each one of us and the possibility of change and transformation. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Saviour's blood?
Jessica Dalton and your friends for that very spirited rendition of And Can It Be. I think Charles Wesley would have approved. And thank you to Fran and Chris Morehouse from Barnes for leading us earlier in Brother Sister Let Me Serve You. Now, I do hope that sermon wasn't too challenging, too difficult. Please do contact me if it has raised any particularly painful memories or anything you'd like to discuss. And if you would like to explore the subject further, please do look at the Bible studies we produced this week on this subject. I'd like to introduce to you now Mickey Youngson, who is the chair of the London District. Many of you will know her already. Mickey is going to be taking over from me as superintendent during my absence. And she's very kindly agreed to lead our prayers of intercession today. Hello everyone, it's good to join you for worship today. And now we share in our prayers of intercession, let us pray. God, who has adopted us into your family, may we come before you in prayer, knowing that you understand our every need. We pray for your world today. We see the effects of the COVID-19 virus unfold, and many of us are afraid and bewildered. We pray for comfort for those who mourn, healing for those who are ill, and courage for those who offer care. Loving God, hear our prayers. We pray for those who have lost their livelihoods, for those who worry about the future, and those who are anxious for their fam families and friends. We remember those who lead us, praying for governments around the world, that wisdom and care might guide their thinking. Loving God, hear our prayers. We pray for children, confused and sad because they miss their friends, for older people and those who are vulnerable, and for those who worry about them. We remember those who have died, those known to us and those known only to you. Loving God, hear our prayers. We pray for the whole church, the body of Christ in the world, and particularly today, the Richmond and Hounslow circuit. Thank you for the courage and generosity of all who adopt children, and remember those today who long for a loving family of their own. Loving God, hear our prayers. Accept these and all our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Mickey. Please do subscribe to this YouTube channel because there's lots of material here as well in addition to our Sunday services. Uh, each day there's a daily Bible study. Last week we looked at adoption. Next week we'll be looking at a psalm a day. And uh, my colleague Claudia Lupi, Minister at Richmond, uh, will put on a weekly meditation uh, in, in midweek which you may find helpful. And that, of course, is in addition to the material for young people put out by Megan. So please do subscribe if you uh, would like to. On your behalf, I'd like to thank everybody who's taken part in today's service. And after a rather serious service, I thought I'd conclude with an anecdote to, to almost thank somebody who almost participated. Um, as you know, we've had quite a few adventures making these things. Um, I almost got arrested recording the sermon outside Buckingham Palace for Palm Sunday. And I had to go to record the sermon slots on Barnes Common. I had to go very early in the morning to catch the light. 
and it's I've learned it's very frustrating filming outdoors because of all the noise and the things that happen and I was um, so I hope my frustration didn't show in my clip in the clips um, and I was struggling to record the second part when two dogs came up and started sniffing round. I thought oh, this is all I need and then the owner started coming up and chatting a very nice man and because I was wearing the dog collar he was asking about what I was doing and he was very interested in what was happening and during our conversation I thought to myself I know you from somewhere and, and that's not unusual being a minister um, and then I worked out he was Michael Ball um, who's currently number one in the charts of course and um, he was terribly friendly and I said well my congregations won't believe this has happened so please could we have a photograph so we've he agreed very kindly agreed to a socially distanced selfie that's why we look like an album cover as one friend observed uh, but he sent, sends you his best wishes um, and after he left I was just kicking myself that I didn't ask him to sing for us so perhaps next time and I hope that whoever records these services in the future has equally interesting adventures making them. My special thanks once more to Ben Waterhouse for putting this service together and for all those who have made our services in the past. This is my last service with you for some time now as I go on adoption leave. I'm leaving you in the very capable hands of Mickey and my colleagues in the circuit. And I'd like to thank all of you for your kind wishes, your prayers and your support during this time. Please be assured that you will remain in my prayers while I'm away. And I very much look forward to being with you once again. And God willing, by then we should be able to meet and worship together in person. Won't that be wonderful? Until then, I pray that you may know that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And that in Jesus Christ, he walks with us every day of our lives and will never desert or abandon us. Until I see you again, God bless, go well, and if possible, stay safe. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and upon our world this day and evermore. Amen. To conclude our worship, Imogen, Tim and Lauren will lead us out in another favourite I know. Lord, the light of your love is shining. Shine, Jesus, shine. Goodbye. Thank you.